All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the first, well, obviously the first talk in the CHI speaker series this semester, seeing as how uh, this is first week of what, if you look outside, is very obviously the spring semester. Uh, that aside, and with the flu going around uh, and, and, and weather conditions being what they are, I'm quite pleased to see you all here uh, and, and uh, uh, glad that this uh, has piqued your interest. We are, uh, of course, delighted uh, uh, to really not introduce to you today, uh, but, but I suppose present a forum for uh, Ohio University's own Dr. Nuket Sandal. Uh, and before I do anything else, I, I really want to uh, thank you for you know, all the conversations uh, in, in the last five years or so around all things war and peace, which covers a pretty small spectrum of life. Um, my name is Ingo Troschweitzer. I'm the director of the Contemporary History Institute. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar uh, with CHI, we're a multidisciplinary uh, uh, institute that joins the perspectives of history, economics, political science, and journalism uh, in an effort to make sense of the questions that define our time, things such as religion uh, and, and, and peace building, uh, for example. Uh, Nuket Sandal, of course, enriches the uh, political science department at OU and, and also serves as director of uh, global studies, and she co-directs the war and peace theme. She, she now has a much more competent co-director uh, than, than she used to, I'm told. Um, she earned her PhD from the University of Southern California, uh, and before joining the faculty at OU, uh, uh, held a very prestigious postdoctoral fellowship at the Watson Institute of International Studies at Brown University in Rhode Island. Her newest book, and, and the reason uh, for, for this talk today, uh, of course, is as you can see, Religious Leaders and Conflict Transformation, Northern Ireland, uh, and beyond, uh, which appeared for Cambridge University Press uh, last spring uh, in, in 2017. Um, before that, Professor Sandal published uh, Religion in International Relations Theory, jointly with Jonathan Fox, that was in 2013, and, and uh, quite a few uh, journal articles. One of them I'll mention, uh, a comparative study uh, of religious leaders and, and uh, violence transformation in South Africa and Northern Ireland, uh, earned her the 2011 Best Article in uh, the Review of International Studies Prize. Um, I want to add, too, that, that Nukent uh, is, is really a dedicated teacher, uh, as, as well as, as, as evidenced, uh, among other things, by her winning the uh, college's uh, Jeanette Griselli Brown Faculty Teaching Award uh, not too long ago. And if I, if I remember that, that particular award ceremony uh, somewhat, uh, accurately, there were there were three awards, uh, and for the life of me, I know one was for for HTC, uh, and and uh, the the third escapes me now. But uh, of course, this meant you had to hire a team of porters to get things from Baker uh, over to Bentley Annex to her office uh, and uh, the the, uh, the trophies. I'll finally uh, just say. Uh, that her name came up just now in the in the board of trustees meeting as as as, as one of the outstanding editors of uh, an OU Press series. So uh, uh, for someone who's who's been here a mere five years, you've really left quite an impact. Uh, uh, going going on uh, five years, going on twenty, I would I would say by by, by that measure. All right, so we'll go with the typical format, the standard format, which is about a forty-five to fifty-minute talk, uh, followed by about. 40 minutes or so for questions uh, and, and, and answers. Uh, I will go with the standard uh, uh, shameful advertisement. We have another talk next week, same place, uh, same time, right here at 4.30 in the afternoon. That is by Edward Kaplan, a uh, professor at the Army War College, who will talk about his book on air atomic strategy in the Cold War. Uh, so little less peace building uh, in, in, in that, I suppose. So now with that, I hope that you'll join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Sandal uh, uh, to CHI and also thanking her for, uh, for all her teaching and service here uh, at Ohio. Thank you very much, Ingo. This was probably the most generous introduction I have received so far. And you are now number one person who will speak. Um, I'll tell my husband if something happens to me. Like I want you to give the uh, background, because I don't think he could be that generous. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, the Contemporary History Institute and um, Connie Hunter for all the help um, that we got. 
I have been attending the amazing talks for the past couple of years. I learned a lot um, and I had I have really enjoyed um, these talks, so I am really happy to be here as a speaker today. Having said that, I have to warn you that I am not a historian, so I know there are many um, junior colleagues here too um, from both political science and history department, and I was talking to a couple of colleagues about different approaches we have. Um, so I am not claiming to be a Northern Ireland specialist, so this is just one of the cases I found fascinated, uh, fascinating, uh, and I worked on for only five, six years, um, and um, particularly being interested in the role of um, religious leaders. So before I get started with the talk, and I asked uh, my friend Ingo to get up after four hours if I'm still continuing, uh, please feel free. Uh, I love talking about my research, like all of us. Um, I just wanted to tell you a bit about how I started with this project. So this is my um, dissertation project, second book, but the dissertation project. Um, when I, long story short, um, when I started thinking about what I will focus on, my first candidate was Middle East. And then as my colleagues who work on Middle East well now, I thought like I'm in a political science department. If I start doing a thesis on Middle East, that might take 10 years, given the different inclinations of my advisors. So I thought, what is one case that I have always wanted to explore? I don't have any strong ideas about. Um, and that would not require me to do a lot of language investment. I know this does not sound very scholarly, but this is what you do when you're a PhD student who needs to finish the thesis in three years. Um, so I, so I have always been fascinated by Irish culture. And I have been to Ireland, Northern Ireland before. I, I had been to Northern Ireland before. So I thought, you know, I have been hearing about this religion aspect, troubles period, Northern Ireland. Why don't I explore that? Maybe I can look at the um, religious discourse that the politicians used during that troubles period, but I should be a religious discourse because they are talking about Catholics and Protestants, right? So I, I defended my proposal, and then I went to my field trip, started doing archival research. No, the politicians don't talk about religion. And there was only one guy who I will mention profusely, Ian Paisley. He was the only guy who talked about religion. So, okay, the dissertation will not be written on that subject, but I'm on the field trip, so I need to find a, an alternative topic. And at that point, I had already started interviewing um, politicians, civil society activists, and by chance, religious leaders. And then I was going to those interviews, and I was telling uh, my colleague, Steve Miner, um, that I had actually a very easy time securing those interviews because I was the first Muslim woman who was interviewing those people. And normally they reject, they are very um, tired of some of the interview stuff. And they were like, no, I'm not gonna give another interview. But this woman is from Turkey and she's a Muslim woman. And they are like, really? Okay, let's see what she's looking for. So I could secure many of these interviews really easily. And I was talking to these religious leaders and I noticed one thing. They were sending, first of all, if you are in Belfast, everybody knows what you are doing. It's a small city. Everybody you interview knows your plans tomorrow better than you do. And uh, like, you know, next day, oh, next week you are seeing um, Dr. Dunlop. Great, say hi to him, and I hope his wife has recovered, something like that. So I'm like, wow, like, so these guys really know each other, and they have a long-standing relationship. So this happened four or five times. And then at that point, I was like, there is something going on with the religious leaders. They know each other too well. They have been talking about, oh, we have been friends for 40 years. Like, okay, so he's Catholic, you are, so things have been going on. So I looked at the literature, I and mean, I already knew the peace building literature a, little bit, literature a little bit. When you look at the literature on Northern Ireland and peace building, there are really good works, obviously. But there is not much about systematically what these people did. There are snapshots of, oh, here is the story of um, Archbishop Eames, and a snapshot about his life. But there is no collective account of what these guys did and what they achieved. So I thought that I would be really interested in that, and um, I would look into, during the Troubles period, 
how did how did religious leaders play a role? Did they play a role? Um, how did they communicate? Did they communicate? Were they in touch? And did they have an influence in the transformation for better or for worse? So that was my research question. Um, the photo here is, um, you know, after you write a book, it is at the publisher, and they tell you like they will um, publish this with a boring blue cover, which is my first book the standard cover, and I, I felt really bad about that, and I said, no, I will find something, please don't do it, the blue covers. So I found this photo, this photo, and I will again make a brief reference to this, is um, from Fecal Talks, and this, is, this was an initiative by leaders of the four main churches in Northern Ireland to talk with the paramilitaries, with IRA. It was cut short because police came, but in later conversations, IRA officials said that they were ready to stay for days and the clergy was ready to stay for days if necessary to come to an understanding that they could convey to politicians, and this is 1974, only six years after trouble started. So this shows the dedication, and these, these people are um, Reverend George Temple, um, Presbyterian moderator, Reverend Harold Sloan, uh, president of Methodist Church, Cardinal Conway, Roman Catholic, and Archbishop uh, Otto Sims Church of Ireland. Members of four different churches together trying to talk to paramilitaries and cut by police at the time. And I saw this photo, and there was only one. Like when you Google fecal talks, not many things come up. And I said to myself, I want this photo because this is my book. This is my argument for you guys. I mean, you can just look at the book cover and see what I'm going to talk about. Um, and after um, three months negotiations with the um, copyright holder and Cambridge, I'm so happy that now this is my book cover. So emotional. So um, I will give the standard disclaimer since I have less than an hour. I'm just going to give you snapshots uh, about the book, about the argument. If you are interested in um, like a specific period, specific event, or an argument, we, I'm happy to discuss anything in Q&A. So, um, this is my outline. Since I am a political scientist, I'm using a political science framework, and I'll talk a little bit about this. Then I will give you a like, very brief definition of troubles. In the book, I have an entire chapter about Northern Irish history and religious references. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and then I will give you snapshots and the um, trajectory of the change in religious leader activism across the decades. Then I'll talk a little bit about what's happening now, what happened after 1998 Belfast Agreement. And then I will end with what are some future research questions, what does this mean, um, hopefully in the next like 45 minutes. Okay. So in religion and politi global politics or religion and international relations um, literature, there are not many theories of um, religious agency. Like um, our colleagues in sociology or our colleagues in religious studies have done much better job than political scientists to develop the frameworks, like how do they have an impact in um, politics. I am not going to use too much of this framework during this presentation, um, and I want to focus more on what happened in Northern Ireland. Um, but I put, you will see some references to the theoretical framework. That's why I will briefly define what I'm um, arguing here. So epistemic communities, it's obviously we, uh, as the political scientists, we stole the concept from the sociologists. Um, but in political science, um, Peter Haas and Emmanuel Adler, two political scientists, um, defined epistemic communities as what you see um, on the PowerPoint, network of professionals with recognized expertise and competence in a particular domain, and an authoritative claim to policy relevant knowledge within that domain or issue area. This theory was used to explain the role of science communities in policymaking, especially during the Cold War. So how did the atomic scientists 
um, have a, an impact in nuclear policy making. And then it was applied to other science communities, like health scientists, like how did it impact AIDS regimes? So I thought, well, maybe what the religious leaders um, come together for can be regarded as a, a community of expertise that has um, a, a, an authoritative claim to policy relevant knowledge. So if you look at just the definition, it is totally um, in line with um, what epistemic communities mean. So um, I basically applied this framework to Northern Ireland and the, uh, the transformation of the concept of citizenship and um, conflict transformation. Mm -hmm. Having said that, this can be from my point of view. And I remember when I was a graduate student, when I told Haas and Adler about this, they actually rebuked me during a conference and said, you did not understand the concept at all. And then after I published the article, I was invited to be a discussant on their panel. So I, I think I made my point better in the book. So um, religious leaders do come up with different understandings of um, like, or interpretations of um, scriptures or the tradition as it applies to many issues, not just conflict transformation. It can be health, it can be any public policy issue. I'm currently interested in the Salafi understandings of governance, jihad. I mean, there is an under, there is an agreed on framework that people hold each he, um, people hold uh, each other to. So, fine, it's not scientific, and maybe you don't want to call it scientific knowledge, but it's a form of expertise. It is relevant. So uh, let's take the, take them seriously as a community of expertise. So, the categories I use throughout the book is. And these units of variation, innovation, selection, and diffusion are things that are inherent to that epistemic communities theory that Adler and Haas developed. Units of variation, what are the religious leaders focusing on? Again, it can be health, it can be governance, it can be any public policy. Innovation, how do they change it? And I added for uh, subcategories of uh, innovation, I borrowed those four categories from uh, Ted Jelen, an American politics and religion scholar. Conversion, this doesn't mean like converting someone from a religion to another, uh, changing opinions. So American politics and religion scholars use it in that category. Mm -hmm. Agenda setting, setting the terms of the debate. Reinforcement, representing the interests of the community, their own community. If you are a Catholic leader, you want to represent your Catholic laity. Empowerment, and then giving them the tools to deal with the issue. So you do these innovations. And then at some point, political leaders pay attention to this. And they change their policies in line with what you envisioned. And then these ideas spread to other contexts. So you will see, I, I will give you some quotes to um, convey the different interpretations and views. And I put little um, terms in italics right next to them sometimes. So they are referring to this category. Again, I don't want to make this too much about the theoretical framework. So what did I use to look at the religious leaders' activism or activities um, during the Troubles period? So one thing I wanted to look at was if a Northern Irish person got up in 1980 and looked at one of the four major newspapers, what did they see about the religious leader's message? One um, disclaimer I have is I'm not claiming that all religious, like all clergy were on the same page. I was interested only in the church leaders, like top level. Um, and I looked at um, a lot of issues of the Belfast Telegraph, the newsletter, the Irish News, and the Irish Times. Two of these newspapers, um, the Newsletter and the Belfast Telegraph, are regarded as predominantly Protestant or Unionist perspectives. And the Irish News and Irish Times represent uh, more the Catholic and um, the um, Republican or um, Nationalist perspectives. So 
I coded every um, first three page news that were about these leaders and what they said. And then I had uh, more than 50 interviews with religious leaders, civil society leaders, journalists, and sometimes ex-paramilitaries. And then in Northern Ireland, there is really a, a wealth of church press books um, and small presses that publish religious leaders' uh, memories and um, experiences. So I have collected more than uh, 50 manuscripts that were published by those publishers or uh, the churches to look at what they envisioned. And these books were published at different times. OK. So quick overview of the troubles for those of you who are not familiar with what I'm talking about. So this is a very violent conflict between 1968 and 1998. More than uh, 3,700 lives lost, and it, it, is, it's very, it was very serious. And I will be making reference to um, nationalists. Um, and when we are talking about militant nationalists, we use Republicans. Not every, I mean, there is, the, of course, the connotation of Catholics with nationalists. But um, I mean, I have met, and there are uh, Protestants who also qualify as nationalists, even if like uh, small in small numbers. And Unionists, Loyalists, or Protestants are the um, segment of the population that would like to stay in union with United Kingdom, and the rest are more um, attached to uh, Republic of Ireland. So, since I will be talking about the four main churches a lot. Um, here is the demographic distribution of Northern Irish population. Um, Catholic Church is, of course, a unitary structure, 48%. Um, Presbyterian, and when I'm talking about Catholics, I might say Roman Catholic, because as you know, technically, Church of Ireland is also a Catholic Church. So we can go into that later. Presbyterians, 21%. Per, uh, Church of Ireland, 15%, Methodist, 4%. Of course, there are other denominations, but in the literature, when we say four main churches in Northern Ireland, we mean these four. All right, so I will start with 1970s. So when the, um, I will not talk a lot about the beginning of the troubles, why did it start? It was basically the Northern Irish, uh, Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association had a uh, march and they could not get the permit for the march, but they still walked at the same, on the same day, um, the, um, a Protestant uh, fraternal organization organized another walk. There were clashes, there was a lot of violence uh, and the police used disproportionate violence against the Catholics. Um, so the troubles period, as we know, it started. So initially, this, uh, at the civil rights movement, the nationalist movement, did not regard religion as a dividing point. And according to the activists, the fight was more class-related than religion-related. Um, and voicing a mar Marxist understanding, Bernadette De Devlin, who is a very prominent civil rights activist, at the time, drew attention to the, the hypocrisy of Catholic slum landlords marching virtuously beside the tenants they exploited and Catholic employers marching in protest against the Protestants they excluded from their factories. This is a Catholic person talking. So from their point of view, it was, I did not see religion as a main point. So um, the first reactions you see from the religious leaders is exactly this. This is not religious, don't look at us. So um, they gave many interviews and they said that this is, this is just a nationalist or class-based conflict and all religious leaders actually were trying to distance themselves from troubles. Having said that, they wrote together, getting together, they wrote letters to British policymakers saying that things are getting serious, you better get involved. So when did they start talking about the religious dimension of this conflict? After Ian Paisley came into the picture. 
So Ian Paisley is a very controversial character, as you, th those of you who are familiar with Northern Irish history know. Um, he established a um, political party, and then uh, he had co-founded the Protestant Telegraph in 1966, which quickly became known for its strong anti-Catholic stance. He called the Pope Antichrist. So this is a very vocal guy who protested every event that the Pope attended. So he was really widely um, passionate about his religious views. And his Democratic Unionist Party that he established in 1971 complicated the picture by blurring the line between politics and religion. So um, after Paisley's entry to the um, stage, the religious leaders were in a, at a weird point. So there is this guy who, is talk, who claims that he's talking about Protestantism. And you say that it has, we have nothing to do with the conflict. So he basically tried to dominate the scene and hijack the religious discourse. And um, the other leaders said, no, you cannot do this. So they started to denounce Paisley in very religious terms. Um, so within the Within the Protestant church, the leaders criticized Paisley's political clergy identity, and the president of the Methodist church at the time, Eric Gallagher, stated that the time has come for the Protestant churches to spell out the biblical reasons why Paisley does not speak for them. This is a turning point in the religious leaders' involvement in politics. Um, a Church of Ireland bishop Again, it's very important for the, of course, the Catholics are against Paisley. I mean, there is no um, point of explaining that part. But the uh, Protestant churches actually took this very seriously. So the Church of Ireland Bishop Richard Hansen said that there are those in public life who style themselves ministers of religion and wear clerical colors, but who bring nothing of the message of religion to politics. They merely stand for a section of the Protestant community and only serve the identification with politics. So he enters the scene with his fundamentalist agenda, and then the church leaders start talking. So this also makes us, and maybe you can generalize this to certain settings. If usually religious leaders start quiet in conflict settings, and there has to be like a point where you say, we have to go in and we have to talk. So in this um, the Irish uh, setting, it was that point. So um, then in 1974, there were, there, there were the fecal talks I talked about. So one thing to keep in mind is that when I say religious leaders, those people are not always representing their churches. They are sometimes there because of their religious convictions, but they are not representing the church's strategic interests. So the churches were not always on board with what the religious leaders did. They sometimes had to do things in secret. So fecal talks, they tried to get in touch with paramilitaries. It didn't work because um, the police came. Um, and finally, in 1976, with the violence levels increasing, the Irish Council of Churches and the Roman Catholic Church Joint Group on Social Questions published a report, Violence in Ireland, and they criticized the churches for being uh, for their implicit role in uh, increasing bitterness in Northern Irish society. So almost like 10 years after the conflict comes a document that says, yes, we have a role in this and we have to make it right. So if you look at the Irish history, and this is, this is the part I'm not going into, this is even a big new for the entire Irish history, the members of four different churches like, coming together try to give a message saying that don't, don't go into this. And there is a midway, and we can talk, and we can agree. And they were denounced both by paramilitaries and, um, and politicians. So this is one quote um, for each decade. I have, um, I have a quote that I feel represents the uh, mood the best. In the book, I use the quotes as they are a lot because I just want to uh, show the exact words of these um, religious leaders. So um, 
this is this quote shows um, the first absorption of in party politics. The Christian cannot be a party politician without reference to Christian principles, but equally unacceptable is absolute abstention. If it is to serve the interests of its Lord and his work, the church cannot refuse to speak on the burning issues of the day. So here we are in 1970s, we are starting to um, talk about um, politics. 1980s. Um, so I interviewed one of the prominent Methodist um, leaders, Harold Good, and he used that word for 1980s. So um, they started talking, but at the same time, they started to publicly give statements on controversial issues like internment, um, which was the um, interrogation of political prisoners without due process. And religious civil society got stronger. There were um, new non-governmental organizations that focused on common Christian understandings. And um, behind the stage meetings going on with the uh, high profile politicians, And one of the most prominent of these behind the stage meetings was um, Father Alec Reed's facilitation of the establishment of a United Nationalist Front that would renounce violence and work for negotiation. So it is very difficult to underemphasize the role of Alec Reed. This is a guy who Jerry Adams, um, Sinn Fein leader and former uh, provisional IRA leader, um, said that. I mean, without Alec Reed, I would never be able to understand uh, what was really going on on the ground. So Alec Reed was advising Jerry Adams uh, behind the closed doors, and he says that in his uh, memoirs. And you also see uh, these religious leaders advising political leaders uh, very discreetly at different points. And then there are Attempts at theological innovations, what I mean by that is they started to question their own deeply held theological beliefs. For example, uh, there is Westminster Co um, Confession of Faith for Presbyterians, which refers to the Pope in not so favorable terms. Um, they actually said, why don't we talk and change this a little bit? because right now we are in this conciliatory mode and there was this uh, Vatican II in 1960s. So maybe we can tweak some of our theolog theological um, views a little bit. So um, they, there are many calls in those newspapers um, for joint prayers. And there are common theology classes. Like, and they said, and I have all these quotes, but I, I, I I decided to abandon my notes because otherwise I will talk for five hours. So they decided to hold common theological classes, like Catholics and Protestants together, let's come and let's talk about Christian leadership and Christian understanding of citizenship rather than sectarian understandings. This is, this is huge. I mean, this is something you could not see before, like educational meetings, trainings, workshops. You see these things in the newspapers. When you look at the newspaper in 1980s, the uh, Presbyterian moderator and the Methodist minister and the Roman Catholic bishop call all our citizens for a joint prayer that will be followed by a theological workshop. So there are multiple examples of that, which are, as I mentioned in the beginning, again, in the book, I'm more detailed about this, in a way, empowerment. So here are some tools, like if you have a hostile Protestant neighbor you can use these theological references to convince them that there is a way out. So one of the, um, again, very prominent peacemakers and uh, former Presbyterian church moderator, um, since God cannot be pri privatized to only one of our two communities or to the European community, of which our two countries are members, the challenge is to listen and speak across the frontiers and not to become the private chaplains of only one community. This has become easier since the end of Vatican II, 
when the people in the churches are frequently now in frank discussion with one another. So Vatican II was obviously, it changed the terms of the debate across the world, in the Catholic world, and even in conflicts across borders. So this was a huge step. And this is uh, Church of Ireland Archbishop Robin Eames. Um, there are two levels in the political process in Northern Ireland. There is the involvement of elected members of parliament at Westminster, and there is the whole complex picture of local government at home. And then there are fields where cooperation is surely possible. We don't need to start talking about the super hard issues. Um, agriculture, health, tourism, regional development. So these are all foundations that could bring a new awareness of what is possible. In political science, we call this like functionalism. Start with the other uh, things that are more technical and we will come to difficult political issues in long term. And I have been involved in many um, interfaith initiatives, and that's always you know, how it starts. We will just help in the soup kitchen together, and then you don't start these interfaith issues. Let's talk about the Middle East. If you start like that, we are gone anyway. So you want to start with things that everybody agrees on. Do you want to serve soup to the like uh, homeless? Sure, we will all go. So after six months, seven months of working together, then you, one step at a time, you come to sensitive issues. So this was um, what he suggested. Bishop Cahill Daly, Roman Catholic Church. Again, church leaders should try to develop inter-congregational contacts between parishes and congregations throughout our churches so as to involve more and more of the so-called ordinary churchgoers in ecumenical activity. Ecumenism must be an important element in the theological and pastoral education and training of all candidates for the ministry. Catholic seminarians and Protestant candidates for the ordained ministry should have opportunities for joint contact and discussion and, where possible, shared sessions and seminars. This, these are pretty big words to, to speak at a point where the conflict is really flaring. So, 1980s were the years that the uh, church leaders were really vocal, um, organized lots of meetings, workshops, continued talking to paramilitaries and the politicians. And then comes the, of course, we jump to 1990s. Uh, there is the peace agreement, 1998, Good Friday or Belfast uh, agreement, whichever you prefer. So, again, that agreement was made possible. And, and in this book, I am not arguing that religious leaders desire to find a common identity led to a conflict resolution. It's not that. What I am setting is a necessary condition you do need the religious leaders, mainstream religious leaders on board in order this to become possible. It doesn't mean that it will become possible immediately. There is no causation there, but um, it definitely helps tremendously if you have this understanding already espoused by religious leaders. So there were some instances of vandalism going on in early 1990s. The churches were burnt down on both sides. And as a gesture, churches reached out to each other and they created common funds to repair um, churches that belong to all the four um, different traditions. Um, and again, the ceasefires, the main ceasefires and Meetings were made possible by religious leaders who met with these uh, paramilitaries. Direct influence, uh, Father Alec Reed and Reverend Roy McGee actually helped draft the documents of uh, prior documents to Belfast Agreement to make it more palatable than uh, the peace agreements of 1970s and 1980s. So we are here talking about, we are beyond the indirect influence right now. They are actually helping, okay, you put together this document in this way with this language. And epistemic innovations continue. We talked about the Presbyterians questioning their own Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, Church of Ireland has traditionally been uh, associated with what's called Orange Order. It's a big Protestant fraternal order that um, was very passionate and aggressive 
about their methods. Church of Ireland very clearly distanced itself from we don't want to be associated with Orange Order anymore. So there are these um, renunciation of long-held um, alliances. Open declarations of positions in Belfast Agreement. That's another novelty. There was Sunningdale Agreement in 1974 and then Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. In none of these, the religious leaders openly espoused, they, uh, expressed their opinions. Before this one, they said, OK, this is not an easy decision. We recognize they have their shortcomings, but we say yes. So they contributed to a um, more favorable environment for this agreement. This is Ian Paisley in two different episodes. The first one, it says, actually smash Sinn Féin, uh, which is lovely, whatever that is. Um, and the second one, this photo was so famous. So Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, a very famous um, IRA, former IRA um, officer and first deputy minister of Northern Ireland. So these guys are basically representing the factions that started the conflict, and then they ended up uh, doing the peace and governing Northern Ireland together. So, and they were called Chuckle Brothers for this photo. Um, and it was quite a, quite a leap of this anti-Catholic Ian Paisley who wanted to smash Sinn Féin, um, and then they are together like governing Northern Ireland in peace. These are the statements of, you can read them, um, some high-level decision makers openly saying that during those years, we were asking the church leaders what they thought. And um, Jerry Adams, Alec Reed connection, Archbishop Robin Eames with Albert Reynolds, and this is, these are just some, I, I guess like, out of all these uh, biographies and autobiographies I read, the only person who did not consult with religious leaders was Margaret Thatcher. So not, not very surprising. But John Major um, also said, you know, this is, I, I turned um, to religious leaders um, in complete privacy. So in Northern Ireland, when you talk to people, people are rightly very bitter about the passive stance of religious leaders. But in this book, I'm also trying to show that they were not completely passive. I mean, there were things going on. There was only so much they can do, because if I am the Presbyterian moderator, the leader, and if I say that I am right now holding joint parties with my Catholic counterpart, I will lose my Presbyterian community. Because, I mean, people are dying on the street. What are you doing, like, hugging the Catholic uh, bishop? So they had to be careful. I mean, it, this is not a time to um, jeopardize your situation. Post-conflict, there are some terrible quotes about um, um, secularism um, by Cahill Daly, for example, who says that it is worse than Nazism and fascism. So it is very wild. I mean, you read all these amazing things that people did, and all of a sudden, when secularism is talked about, they are like, we hate that. So there, was this, there are lots of quotes that say that our common enemy is secularism, and this is why we had IRA, this is why we had all this violence, so now let's um, join powers. Christianity should win. Protestants, Catholics, we will all co come together and fight against secularism. Um, again, joint workshops and theology classes more formally. And then the interesting thing is, especially after the peace agreement, churches now decide that it's a good time to come on board and own the process. So they, they open new uh, peace initiatives, peacemaking offices that have their own workshops. Um, so it is a fascinating change. Protestant paramilitaries start to meet with Roman Catholic leadership, which is a huge thing because they did not before. Ulster Defense Association has a um, political wing, which is called Ulster Defense Association Research Group. <laughs> Way to go. So they met with Roman Catholic clergy to talk about, OK, here are our expectations. What are your expectations? So these conversations started to. So everybody is talking to everybody at this point. And then another interesting thing that started after the peace agreement, Northern Irish religious leaders started to talk about global politics in general. US involvement in Iraq, there are many condemning statements about that. Middle East, Israel, Palestinians, let us talk about that. So 
they were quite confident it was very different from the 1940s, 50s, 60s religious leadership in Northern Ireland. Now they had the confidence of, well, it has a reasonable, we will see with Brexit how things will go. That's why I wanted to publish this really quickly because I wanted to have like a two year shelf life. Um, so they, they were like, well, we, we did this and we played a good role, so why not talk about, they, they were invited to Iraq uh, to share their opinions about sectarianism and how to get over it. Obviously, that, I, I mean, it did not quite go well, but um, they, there are many workshops that are organized in Colombia, in South Africa, in um, like interfaith communities in Israel, Palestine. So they are now the experts. So this diffusion happens uh, across borders. This is not without caveats, and again, that's why I want to end the Northern Irish case with a slight bit of note of caution. Um, one of the uh, religious leaders I interviewed said that at this point, Northern Irish communities are more segregated than ever. So, because people are afraid. Like, if we go back to those days, I don't, my, I, I don't want my next door neighbor to be a Protestant or a Catholic, so I feel more secure. In, in these areas. So um, right now the peace initiatives are going on, everything is still good, but I have to say that one thing I was really surprised by was the amount of um, external support, European Union support for the peace process. So we will see how, how much of those will stay. I was talking to a taxi driver who was a protestant paramilitary during the troubles period. And I asked, uh, the best people to interview are taxi drivers. You don't even need to interview them, you just ask one in every country. You just ask a question and here it goes. So he said that, you know, I have three kids who are going to schools, so I have a pension, I have money enough for me, so I don't want to go back to those days. But it is all related to his well-being, obviously. There is no, um, there is no incentive. But if the economic situation was not that good, I don't know what the situation would be. So there is still segregation going on, uh, but at the same time, it, we, had, we have had at least a short period of um, stability or happy ending. And I was also um, saying that the first time I went to Belfast was right around the Belfast Agreement, and I remember how, um, it was, we, we, there was only a couple of cafes, restaurants, it was not exactly a university town. And then the first time I went for my um, field research, again, 2004, it was a cosmopolitan city. I mean, it, those of you who have graduated from universities in Belfast and uh, been to Belfast have noticed that, um, I mean, you have very high-end restaurants, bars, it's a vibrant city. Um, so in, in a very short time, Belf Belfast has changed tremendously. So we are just hoping that this will continue to be the case. So in the book, as a political scientist who need to justify the um, applicability of this theory to multiple cases, I talk a little bit about South Africa. In that case, um, as you know, Dutch Reformed Church was the main, one of the main actors who started apartheid in um, South Africa in 19th century. And again, it was Dutch Reformed Church which renounced apartheid one year before it was politically ended. So in that case, I am arguing that, and you see Bayer Snowde and uh, Desmond Tutu together, like it, a particular theology was developed and furthered and Dutch Reformed Church had to change its stance, the main church in South Africa. And I do believe that it is no coincidence that the political demise of um, apartheid followed um, the religious demise of um, the, the doctrine. And then I talk a little bit about um, Colombia case, and this is the photo of uh, Father Javier Giraldo Moreno in Colombia, working with an organization that documents uh, disappearances and human rights abuses. This is a religious organization. And in the case of Colombia, uh, too, when you look at human rights activism, the churches, the religious leaders, not necessarily the churches, had uh, quite an influence. 
And then we have Bishop Ulama Conference in the Philippines here. And the one in Sierra Leone is really interesting because this is the Interreligious Council of Sierra Leone, which played an influential role in ending hostilities uh, during the conflict. But this photo is from 2014, where the same interreligious council was trying to address the Ebola outbreak, the health issue. So the birth of the organization is the conflict, and then they became really um, interested in public policy issues that affect um, Sierra Leone. OK, so the final part. So what, what type of questions does this, um, do these snapshots lead us to? The main takeaway is religious leaders matter beyond just members of civil society, because we always talk about them as just another actor in civil society. No, they produce a certain knowledge. They develop that expertise, and they try to market that to policy and uh, political um, actors. This does not need to be peace and citizenship. This can be anything. So we, are, we don't have any value judgments here. How, however, I was really privileged uh, to look at the case of Northern Ireland, where the religious leaders are coming from a very formal education. And they, they know philosophy. They know like ancient Greece, ancient Rome. Um, like, let's talk about sociology. Let's talk about Miroslav Wolf. So it, it's always, it was an enriching conversation with lots of formal references. So how does this travel to other contexts where you might not have um, the same formal education requirement? I mean, we know in certain Protestant traditions, you know, just piety is enough for leading a community. And also, I mean, I was uh, reading about, as I said, the Salafi conversations about jihad and who leads. Um, so, as you know, there is this very prominent uh, jihadist scholar, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Um, and then there is Zarqawi, who established Al-Qaeda Iraq and ISIS, technically. So there is this question about, Zarqawi has no formal education. Is piety, he was a ze zealot, is pi can piety trump uh, scholarship? in terms of leadership. So there are these questions going on in certain religious traditions. Therefore, it would be interesting to look at how knowledge production happens in different hierarchical uh, traditions. As you have seen, uh, we have shown lots of white male, middle-aged guys. Um, when I was putting the photos, I'm like, well, you know, this is. So this is changing very slowly, but it is changing. When you are talking about 1960s, 70s, 80s, Obviously, the bishop, archbishop level, it's all male. And it's still all male. But at the same time, there is, there is female clergy in different places. So there, is a diff there might be a different um, type of expertise sharing, knowledge production. So I am really interested in reading feminist perspectives on religious peace building. There's a couple of books on that, but it would be a great dissertation topic for someone. Epistemology of violence. I'm interested in how violent actors in all traditions actually use the same type of expertise and production to uh, convince people that we need to get rid of the other party. And um, another question is churches versus religious leaders. When do institutions come on board? And in many cases, you see Muslim leaders, um, Jewish leaders, Hindu leaders, Buddhist leaders working for different issues independent of their institutions. But when do institutions own this and say, OK, we are now on board? Catholic Church was very uh, cautious about Northern Ireland. So they told uh, Jerry Reynolds, the, the very prominent Catholic peacemaker, that whatever you do, you are doing it on your behalf. Like, don't use the Catholic Church as an institution, as, um, as an actor. And also, I'm more interested in religious perspectives at home and diaspora. How do religious traditions travel? And how are they interpreted in diaspora? And are those um, interpretations different from the ones which are produced at home? All right, I think I, am, I will cut it here. And I look forward to the questions to talk more about it.
Okay. Mm -hmm. All yours. Thank you. <laughs> we will probably give the one minute break for people to gently leave. I love this tradition, by the way. This is so convenient. Should we get started? Okay. Yes, please. Um, did these clergymen live under the threat of uh, violence during their uh, attempts to uh, reconcile with each other and, and bring other people on board? Because I'm assuming these paramilitary guys are not, they weren't the most receptive towards any peace-building process initially. They were all, probably all sitting around plotting the next, you know, killing. Um, and, you know, I, I think about other instances like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where a uh, leader like Rabin was assassinated by right-wing zealots in Israel, and that uh, was a major setback to uh, the Oslo Accords peace negotiations mm -hmm. there. What uh, were, were these clergy men, were they, was, was there a threat of it's a, it's a great question. Um, they weren't. I mean, there were, I'm sure there were individual cases where one or two might have been targeted, but I haven't seen this as an overwhelming concern. Um, mostly because their message was not a radical message. They just wanted reconciliation and let's live together. And the, part of the way the paramilitaries talk about it is, oh my God. Like, of course, they are talking about world peace. Right now, we are fighting for our rights. So they thought that, I mean, especially at the IRA site, um, they thought that they were just being maybe cheesy and no, it's not going to happen. But nobody targeted them in terms of um, assassinations or anything like that. Um, because of their message. And also keep in mind that the main things, like the, the meetings with the politicians, are happening behind the doors. Nobody knew about these things until people started to speak about it after the Belfast Agreement, right? These things were not out in 1970s, 80s, even 90s. And I think the thing they were most afraid of was the um, pushback from, the, from their own churches. Because there are many instances of a minister meeting with members of um, IRA or Ulster Defense Association or Ulster Volunteer Force, and then the church immediately says, what are you doing? And no, this person does not represent our. So you might lose your livelihood and job, but in terms of how the paramilitaries see you, it was not um, that controversial. And as I said, they were actually open to meeting with them, and they had zero confidence in politicians, but they were okay, like, okay, we, are, are we going to talk to, like, uh, Father Reynolds? Sure, let him, man of peace, let's talk to him. So it's that kind of environment. It's not as polarized that whoever talks about peace is. And they do, did want to reach to a common position in Northern Ireland, so it was not quite, um, thankfully, it didn't take longer. And as you go across the um, like decades, there are many um, peace agreements that they try to strike. So there is this period where you get slightly optimistic and think that this will happen, and then um, things go down again. And then the religious leaders come back again, saying that now you need to include everyone. So they were like corrective in many cases. So long answer to the question, it, it's not like some other settings that we might think of. Yes, Steve, please. A couple questions. One is a very quick one. But, uh, did Petty Williams have any connection with the church? Because there was one woman who was called in the Nobel Prize. Nobel yes. Prize. But my, my main major question is the Pope during this period, of course, John Paul II in the <laughs> 80s, who was very active in Eastern Europe and is not afraid of getting involved in politics at all, why the unwillingness to do so in Northern Ireland? Uh, is, it, is it because it's not? It might be because he was tired with what was going on, as you said, in Eastern Europe. There wasn't a lot of interest to get involved. Maybe it's because, I don't know how it was from his perspective. To be honest, I haven't read anything John Paul II wrote about this or said about. There were some very general peace messages. We should agree on um, peace, peace is the way. 
So those things happen. There are multiple fun videos of Ian Paisley going into his meetings and telling him that he he's the Antichrist. I was going to start with one of those videos, and I thought, well, the weather is not good. It's the first week of semester. I don't want to start the conversation with Ian Paisley. So um, it wasn't a priority for any reason. And Jerry Reynolds and Clonard Ministry was the center for peace building in Northern Ireland. And there, are, there were many Catholic leaders who became really prominent in actively in peacemaking, but there is no um, active involvement by the Vatican. Uh, Patty Williams' question, um, I haven't looked at the exact connections. There are actually um, activists, peace activists, women, who have worked with these uh, religious leaders, but not at the like ranking religious leadership level. So there's a couple of articles and some books about some of these connections, but it has not been studied systematically. It would be great, again, to study further. Thank you. Yes, please, in the back. Um, with the uh, church getting involved in some public policy, are there any arguments for keeping the separation of church and state, especially in a westernized country? Uh, I see more than others, but I, I, that thought came to my mind. And maybe this is a more humanitarian. Sure. No, I, I totally get your point. And it is, it's, this has been a really interesting project for me because I grew up very secular with certain biases about like church, not church, uh, religion and state. Um, so in this context, you are right. Since the main concern was people killing each other on the streets, and we are again talking about 3,000 deaths, right? Nobody really made that a point uh, that they wanted peace, common Christian understanding, or let's work on transportation together, or they did not try to dominate the agenda. They just wanted to create a, this, a different discourse and narrative about common points. Like, and there are many books about the, the core reasons of the conflict. But the Catholic Protestant shortcuts we use to refer to unionists and nationalists made this, by default, a religious discourse, right? So um, it would be the opinions I heard that are critical of their role was not because of their involvement, it was because of their non-involvement. They were not involved enough. Having said that, now that there is a different environment, I was really surprised that there was not a lot of pushback after Cahill Daly said that secularism is worse than fascism. Um, so people don't take this too seriously. They, they are not afraid that religious leaders will come and govern the country uh, entirely. But there might be some pushback in long term. If it is peacetime, if you see that churches are getting involved in everything, then maybe there will be some of those discussions. But during the Troubles period, as I said, it was more like they could have done more. So, Bill? Are, is your point then you kept that um, a conflict uh, which was not initially defined with religion as a dominant element in the identities of the two opposed groups, mm -hmm. unionists and nationalists, it became increasingly so. And so religion leaders on both sides who might have thought initially that religion wasn't really the issue found themselves dragged into the conflict and, had, and were really responding to it and, uh, and then working in a particular way then to use religion as a means to diffuse it. That is, that is correct. Um, they had to invent ways to do this because that was a new territory for them too. Um, but you are right, there are elements, of course, there is, we cannot say that it's totally not religious, right, when we were using, again, the words Catholics and Protestants. But the roots of the conflict was not, it's, I mean, if you ask my personal opinion, and, and the opinions differ on this topic wildly, um, mostly it is, um, a colonial class-based conflict. So, but at the same time, there, are, there is a religious history, like hundreds of years. And then there are the symbols, religious symbols, that can be made reference to. 
And then there is one person, and I, I tie this activism to Ian Paisley. If Ian Paisley had not existed, I don't think the leaders would have had this, we are, we are Christians and we can find a common way type of narrative. So Ian Paisley comes up and uses those symbols, and then the religious leaders who did not like his fundamentalism had to come up with, okay, we need to find a, a common way and fill this space. And then there is a very context-dependent um, trajectory of activism they followed. Obviously, this would differ in Colombia. This would differ in other settings where other traditions dominate. But I was fascinated to see that it took 30, 40 years with a clear trajectory to, for them to raise their voices and come up with this understanding, which was picked up later, or inspired, let's say, um, politicians who would sign this peace agreement. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I was just wondering about your opinion on the um, kind of crisis in Northern Ireland right now, where they've gone well over a year. Well, not well over. They just passed the year point where they haven't had a national executive, um, which means they don't have a government. Um, and these <coughs> things have been already for those throats. You know, they're just not going to power share anymore, it seems like. Um, in the last UK general election, moderate parties lost tons of votes in kind of those two extreme parties. Um, and even in the last year, the language is just so bitter and so sectarian, kind of parking back to those dark days that you were talking about in the 70s and 80s. So I was just wondering your opinion on that, and also whether the kind of church religious leaders will learn maybe lessons or kind of, uh, from those 70s and 80s and kind of maybe try to help resolve this impasse right now, because it is even a bit of a crisis. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Have they? learned it and would they do it again is a great question. I am, personally, I am worried about it because there is this gloomy air again and it is partly also um, due to the general environment. It is UK politics, it is European politics in general and there is, um, I mean, I, I haven't been to Northern Ireland in the past three years, so I haven't had the chance to face-to-face -to -face talk with people. But there is this fear, and that fear always exists. That fear existed four years ago when I last went. Like, people are, they still remember those days, and they still feel like we should behave in a way that if this happened tomorrow, we are in the right place, and we have the right resources. So decommissioning happened, supposedly, you know, they gave up the arms and things, but... Um, there are still some resources in Belfast, weapons stashes and all these things, and um, people are afraid. I am, I'll tell you one thing, it will not go down if the funding is not cut. If the funding is cut, it's very easy for, this is not a done deal, Northern Ireland is suc tentative success story. So it might go back to uh, dark days, if people feel that, again, economically, they are not able to uh, provide. And that is why um, Democratic Unionist Party and Sinn Féin are increasingly getting more um, supporters because people want to be represented in case things go wrong. So there is that fear going on, and Brexit did not make it obviously easier. The question of religious leaders, what would they do now that their peacemaking offices, and those peacemaking offices are really physical spaces. There are people sitting in it, there are initiatives going on. I am slightly optimistic about that. I think they, since they have the offices right now and they have done it, I think they would be more willing to step in and assist with efforts. But another thing I believe in, I'm a bit materialist in those terms, if there are no resources, there's not much religious leaders can do in that situation. So we will see how that goes. So I'm, I'm not 100% optimistic, but we'll see. Yes? Early on you talked about economic and class issues, but didn't say much more about it later in the talk. Uh, was that uh, something that was more or less left out, or was it a big sideline issue that was solved? It is a, it's a big issue, and um, religious leaders brought that up many times throughout their talks, saying that people are doing this because they don't have jobs, and they need, um, they need employment, they need to be able to provide for their families, and this will end. 
So the reason why this entire thing started was um, the main establishment, the good jobs, the public jobs, went exclusively to Protestants. And the Catholics were left out. And there was a very systematic discrimination. And Northern Ireland um, Civil Rights Association was addressing those issues. For example, you could not enroll in Royal Ulster Constabulary, which is the police force, if you were Catholic. So you were out. Um, and I mean, we are talking about a significant, mind. I mean, it's not mine, it's, it's 90, uh, sorry, uh, 30, 40 percent of the population. So that, that creates a significant um, apartheid type of system. Um, and then, the, of course, the Protestants, um, when things got started, the Protestants got worried that they will lose their Ulster and it will go to Ireland. So they established their own paramilitaries in addition to Royal Ulster Constabulary, which was the police force. So, and at the same time, in general, Northern Ireland was not a rich region. So when we say that Protestants had jobs, it was not like they were uh, having very gainful employment. So throughout the years, um, things evolved in general. And especially when you come to late 1980s and during 1990s, you have Europe, especially um, post-Cold War, investing in Northern Ireland. I mean, we need to improve the situation because now that we left the um, other big issue behind, we can concentrate on this. So they, they got lots of funding. I mean, many of the non-governmental organization leaders, civil society leaders I talked to talk about million euro, million pound grants. So it, is, it helped. You know, I, if I am asking you to come to my workshop in common Christian citizenship, I will pay 30 pounds per hour to you, so you will not be losing employment. And we will develop this understanding, but you, again, like the economic infrastructure is really important. Having said that, what would have happened if religious leaders did not have that message, but you had improved economic conditions? I would say it would take longer to reach this agreement. You could still reach that agreement, but I cannot imagine a conflict setting where you reach peace, but your mainstream religious leaders are not for peace. That, for me, is a very difficult scenario to think about in the context of Northern Ireland. So economic conditions are definitely one of the causes of the improvement of the situation. Yes? Uh, so your case study obviously focuses on the peace building process in Northern Ireland itself, but um, there, there were these sort of transatlantic connections with other religious communities. So I mean, what comes to mind are the two groups in the United States that were most primarily involved would be sort of the, the Irish American community, which in many ways uh, was sort of openly pro IRA mm -hmm. uh, for, 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 for a few decades. Um, I'm also wondering if in the course of your research you happen to come across whether the American bishops that were sort of in touch with these, these Irish American communities that might have been sending remittances to Ireland or you know, the IRA or whatever groups that were, uh, if they were trying to sort of promote the peace process or if they were sort of in line with their constituents' beliefs, or was there any sense that you got from, if you came across any research about the American bishops that were sort of interested in this conflict? Great question, again. Um, I mean, in terms, of course, there were lots of transatlantic funds going to uh, Northern Ireland. But if you, if you talk about religion and religious leaders, the most active link was Ian Paisley and his um, evangelical friends and universities in the US. He visited, at the, at the height of the conflict, he visited multiple institutions. He was given honorary doctorates. Um, and he was really well received, not by um, the Irish Protestant community in the US, but evangelicals. Because even if you are not familiar with Northern Ireland, everybody is familiar with Ian Paisley and his very, very anti-Catholic stance in 1970s. So that was a thing also in multiple setting, um, including in the US, like the you know, driving of evangelical, certain evangelical fundamentalist banners. So he was welcomed by those circles, and he used to travel to US a lot. I mean, you, the way I talk about this is like you would see this in the newspapers. Like Ian Paisley again like went to US, and he was given another honorary doctorate. So, um, in terms of the connections of mainstream church leaders, there are visits, but um, I don't remember anything particular that changed the way they looked at things. They were most, um, the things that they 
kept bringing up. Um, like all of these high profile um, religious leaders, peacemakers, South Africa was a huge like case and connection for them. And uh, another interesting, uh, and again, I was telling Steve about this, another interesting thing was when IRA started to come up with these murals where they portrayed themselves with PLO, um, so the Palestinian cause, the unionists, lo loyalists, I should say, looked at this and thought, so if they are with PLO, what does this make us? Israel. So there are streets in Northern Ireland that are covered with Israeli flags. So they assume that identity too. So it's interesting, and there is a transatlantic connection, but there are many other connections that they, um, not the religious leaders, but the communities and um, military factions draw. It is really fascinating how um, not very US dominated the conversations were, both with um, paramilitary, ex-paramilitaries and the religious leaders. Any more questions? You know where I live, so if you have any questions, please follow up, bring a bottle of wine, and we will talk. Yes, the bottle of wine is, is, is very important. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here.